Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to be back home after having to travel again for work. And so we'll just kind of get right into our, our continue with our study on the history of the church. So as we've gone through some of our some of these previous lessons, we're starting to build now into where we start seeing the departures from the Word of God and the organization of the church in this early time. So this morning in our lesson, we're going to be talking about departures in organization, specifically changes in the leadership model that God has assigned us in the Word of God, uh, and the rise of Rome as a part of the importance of denominationalism, specifically as it pertains to the Roman Catholic Church. But that kind of spirals into a lot of the larger denominations that you see in the world today and had a very significant impact on Christianity um, from then on out. Um, as always, if anyone would like a copy of the outline to follow along, please email me at andrewtmccormick1 at gmail.com. So uh, if you email me, I'll be happy to email you a copy of today's outline. Just let me know which lesson that you're wanting it for, and um, I'll send that to you. So... In every association, whatever the organization or body is, whether it's divinely instituted or mankind or got a club they're putting together, you need to have some type of organization of the leadership and government of that group by which it will be guided. Recognizing his own creation's nature, God designed the church to have certain types of leaders to guide the work of the church. Paul stated this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and he gave some as apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We know these first two offices that are mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 4, they're special offices that were needed for the time, and they have passed from the scene. Um, they fulfilled the function for which they were designed. Um, we know that with 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about when that which has been perfect shall come, that which is in part shall pass away, referring to the gifts, the spiritual gifts and such like that. Um, however, evangelists and pastors or elders or bishops, whichever term you prefer, um, the, and teachers, these continue to be used in their function today. Uh, these were not temporary offices that God had intended. These were the permanent ones that God needed for the perpetuation of the church. As we've already seen in our previous lessons, the church during the first century was ruled by elders with deacons appointed to assist them. That was the divinely mandated order for leadership in the church. A plurality of elders in a congregation with a plurality of deacons, if you have men who are willing and qualified to do take up those roles, but it always had to be a plurality. And again, you never see, as I know, you never see deacons without elders. Whenever we look in the church, we're talking about the office of deacons, you never see them mentioned unless it's unless the elders are present too. So you need elders to have deacons. So Fisher notes in the New Testament there are two classes of officers in each church: the elders, bishops, the elders, or bishops, and deacons. So there's something not only that we see in Scripture; it's noted by historians. The main qualifications for these officers are given in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. Now, these are the main qualifications. We'll read through these real quick. Beginning in verse 1 of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well of his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report among them, 
reporting them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith and a pure conscience, and let these also be first proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons of the be their husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then Titus chapter 1, beginning of verse 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for, for a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, tempered, holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So you see these two passages, they set a lot of qualifications for men who want to be elders and deacons in 1 Timothy 3, in this case. But these are not the only locations we can go to for that for the elders. Uh, we go through a lot of scripture on um, what, what a man wants to do with an elder. Um, this is just kind of a summation. We're not going to spend much time on this today. Lord willing, another lesson we'll build in this topic more deeply. But basically, there are four English terms that come from three Greek words. You could argue five English terms um, that are used in the New Testament to designate the earthly leadership in the church. The first being an elder. This is a translation from Presbyteros that designates age and maturity of the leader, and the word means an older man. Um, it's used of older individuals, whether they be men or women in the New Testament. It's a reference to a period of time um, among the Jews it was used, and then we also see it used a lot. Uh, most, most of the terms ways it's used is talking about the specific office that God has designated as a leader in his church. The next one is shepherds or pastors. It's sometimes uh, Translated as both, poimen designates the care and protection they give to their flocks. Uh, literally, somebody who herds sheep. Then it's also used as a guardian, guardian or leader of the church. It's a reference to Christ in Hebrews 13 and 1 Peter 2. And it's also a reference to human leaders in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, the third one is bishop, comes from the word episcopos. This points out an oversight that they must exercise over the Christians, over their over their under care. Um, it also can be translated as overseer. And we see this several times used in Scripture in Acts, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 1 Peter. During the first century, elders ruled within their own congregation. Whenever Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, um, feed the flock of God which is among you, this is important to understand, and we really have to get this hammered in to understand where the problem starts, starts transitioning this time period. Because in the New Testament, the elders only ruled over those members who were in their congregation. We have eight elders in this congregation at the 70 West Church of Christ. They have zero authority over anyone who's a member of, I don't know, the Highway Church of Christ in Benton. They have zero authority over them. They only have the God-given and scriptural authority over the men and women in the 70 West congregation. Um, that's just the way God designed it. They are not to be they are, they are not to be trying to oversee other congregations either. That's not the way God designed it. We also know that there is always a plurality of elders in each congregation. Um, it's indicated by statements such as Acts chapter 14, when he had ordained them elders. When it's talking about the office, it is always in plurality. Now, we see the term used singularly, such as Peter and his introduction, an elder of the church. Peter is a single person, so he couldn't be el Peter and elders. It wouldn't make sense. So, so, But when it's talking about the office, always a plurality in Scripture. There is no evidence given in Scripture to show that any of the elders of a given congregation had any authority over any of the other elders. 
So causing the departure. One of the first departures that we see in New Testament pattern was in the realm of church organization. So it may be surprising to learn that within the first, first century and a half of the church's existence, the plan of church government was already undergoing a great change in what would develop into the, the papal hierarchy we see in the Roman Catholic Church. This was well on its way by the end of the anti-Nicene period. Um, as we have discussed previously, departures come gradually. They don't happen overnight. And they happen at such a slow pace that the people involved, if they're not watching closely, sometimes they don't even know what's going on. And that's the true case in our lesson. Um, and the, the, the changes in some of this stuff, we could probably safely assume that they were so gradual that those who were living in it didn't even realize it was going on. We can certainly, with a lot of confidence, say that the ones who were making these making these changes might have been innocent at the time, and they not read, but they did not realize where that would take the church two thousand years later. So I think we can say that with a lot of confidence that the decisions they were making then they didn't realize the ramifications that would that would come two thousand years later. Thus, it is very difficult to say exactly when the departure began. Paul indicated that this departure would come from within. When he's talking in Acts chapter 20, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We know this was he was speaking specifically to the elders here, because when you back up a few verses in um, verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, and then he starts going into his teaching there. So we know that he was talking about the elders. We might suggest that there are two reasons why it's difficult to pinpoint the beginning of this departure. Again, as in all periods of church history, um, there were certainly men who were desirous for and capable of more authority than others. Uh, we, we witness this in everything, in every aspect. There are certain people that love power and authority and do whatever they can to get it. And there are certain people who want nothing to do with it. They do not want that burden. There are certainly people who are in leadership that are, have no business being in there, whereas there are certain people that are natural born leaders. They, they're just, that's a gift they have. They're very good at it. And you see that in every aspect, not just in the church. Um, Diotrephes that we see in Third John would be someone that, who was exalting themselves and trying to elevate himself above others. John said that he loved to, loved to have preeminence in the church there so much that he would not even allow an apostle of God to come in. Now, he did not want someone else outshining him, I guess, if we want to be very, very um, nice to him and not, not say it was with bad things, but he loved to have preeminence. He wanted to focus on him, which was a bad thing. The second, uh, second possibility is that the threat of heresy caused the tightening of the bonds of this organization for protective circus, for, for protective purposes. Um, basically, they were circling the wagons. In Ignatius' letter to the Smyrnians, he wrote, to avoid divisions as being the beginning of evils, we all follow, follow the bishop as Jesus Christ, death the Father, and follow the presbyters as the apostles, and have respect unto the deacons. Fisher states that the rise of sex and heresies and the constant demand for a stricter discipline and for united action, this favored the rise of the episcopate that we see in the denominational world. Fourth century Jerome is a very good source for a lot of this information. He did a lot of writing. He did his commentary on Titus in his letter, one, letter 146 to Evangelist. He speaks of the elders. Um, it's interesting whenever you read this, he uses the term priest instead of elders, but he's talking about the elders. But he, uses, he speaks of elders and bishops being two different titles for the same position, with one being a title of age, the other a title of duty. So even by the fourth century, there was still not this, this concrete thing you see in the denominational world where the two completely divided people. It's still one, two terms for the same person, for the same office. 
He goes on to state that elders and bishops were separated because of heresies. In letter 146 to Evangelist, he states that one elder from a congregation would chosen and preside over the rest as a means to remedy schism and prevent each individual from rending the Church of Christ by drawing it to himself. In his commentary on Titus, he states, it was decreed for the whole world that one of the elders should be elected to preside over the others, to whom the entire care of the church should pertain, and the seeds of schism be, would be removed. While we don't know exactly when this departure began taking place, we can state definitively that this change to the leadership of the Lord's Church took place after the days of the Apostles, and it has absolutely no foundation in the Word of God. This is attested by a lot of other writers. We'll look at three of them real quick. Emperor Hadrian wrote a letter to the Council to the, the Consul Sylvanus and claimed that it served as proof that the terms of bishop and presbyter started having a distinctive meaning as early as 134. Um, and the shepherd of Hermas, or also called the pastor of Hermas, in the 27th chapter of Book 3, when referring to those that were the head of the presbyteries, according to various authors, they are described as the bishops, that is, the presidents of the church. So we're already starting to see now in certain places you have one being elevated. Uh, this was estimated this was written about 156. So, you know, now we're getting, you know, First one about 40 years after the death, 40, 50 years after the death of John, 50, 60 years after the death of John. In the commentary on Ignatius, there was an Episcopalian writer that concluded that any language in the writings that were attributed to Ignatius only supported the part of the primitive church, meaning the scriptural version. The language supporting the, the change to church polity was at earliest from the fourth century. So, so it really didn't start gaining traction until after the anti-Nicene period was, o was over. Now, um, but during this time, you start seeing it starting to develop. Jerome, like I said a few minutes ago, was one of our best sources of information. Uh, he lived in the fourth century. Um, Jerome, therefore, did not speak without authority when he affirmed that the prelacy was established after the days of the apostles and as an antidote against schism. Again, we see human logic overriding the Word of God. What looks good on paper and to the human mind can have devastating impacts to the Lord's church. It sounded like a good idea to do this, but it was without biblical authority and it caught wreaked havoc on Christianity. Again, it's from Jerome. Therefore, just this is in his um, commentary on Titus. Therefore, just as the elders know that by custom of the church, the custom of the church, they are subject to one who was previously appointed over them, so the bishops know that they, more by custom than by the truth of the Lord's arrangement, are greater than the priests. Again, priests, same word as elders, he uses it synonymously. Um, so he's pointing out that it wasn't by the word of God, it was by custom, by tradition, that this was done. He declared that the, that the change in leadership had not made its appearance when the letters which would become the New Testament were written. So Jerome confirmed there was not this, we are sticking to the biblical pattern during the days of the first century. Boardman gives the following summation. He lists about six or seven um, items by Jerome that Jerome considered a historical fact regarding the development of the Episcopacy. Based upon scripture, the titles of bishop and presbyter were interchangeable titles, and there was no difference in their authorities. In the original church, the churches were governed by a joint council of presbyters, and that's the biblical model that we see a plurality of elders in a congregation. The government of the church was by presbyters alone until the quarrels and schisms arose, after which one was chosen from among the presbyters to be above the rest, and the whole care of the church was committed to that one man. This change in the church government did not happen all at once, took place little by little. The elevation of one presbyter over another was a human contrivance and was not imposed by authority, but crept in by custom. And Ms. Black, I was very interesting and that the presbyters in Jerome's day knew this very well. So Jerome says this was a, a, a historical fact that even the 
people that were involved in this episcopacy that was the false one, not what God intended, knew that it was not by the authority of the Bible. It was by custom and human contrivance. Now, the last one in Jerome's time, which was the end of the first century, there was no power except in ordination that exercised by a bishop, which might not be exercised by a presbyter. So even at this time, and by the first century, you still don't see the full development of this because the only difference between a bishop or a presbyter was that one was able to ordain people, the other was not. So it still had not quite developed into what we see today. Let's see if I can pronounce it. Monarchical episcopacy. I was having trouble with this one last night. So by this we mean the centralization of power into one or a few higher dignitaries. So monarchy. Monarchal comes from monos, which means an office, so rulership, and episcopacy comes from the word which we get bishop, which means to oversee. Hence, it's a form of government in which one person or a group of persons have a sole rulership. Whenever we look at the denominational world today, the Roman Catholic Church is probably the most highly developed form of this. Um, in the, that we see in the denominational world today. There are other forms of, den of the church government we see in, um, in denominationalism which are incorrect. They are removed from the God-given pattern. They're just not as highly developed of that as the Roman Catholic Church. Um, if, if I just had to make a quick guess, I would say something like the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, is a very close second. They have another, another one's a very highly developed but they're a little bit different because with that one, as we'll talk about Lord Burden in many lessons from now, you know, in their structure, it doesn't just go up to the Bishop of Canterbury, then it goes above him to Parliament and the Monarch of England as the, as the final say in anything the church. So a little bit different form, but it's still very far removed away from the biblical pattern. So the exact manner of the early developments May, might be a moot question. However, it's very clear that early on, one bishop in a given congregation was elevated above the others and was looked up to as having authority superior to the other elders. Um, this person came to wear the title of bishop while the others continued to be referred to as elders or presbyters. Uh, we look at Maddox, he has a very good summation of this. Although the words elder and bishop are used interchangeably in scripture, there is a difference in their meaning. The elder has reference to age or maturity and bishop to oversight or guardianship. This difference of meaning is important to an understanding of the change that developed. In the early church, all elders were bishops or overseers, and each congregation had a plurality of them. However, as the elders had their meetings to discuss the work of the church, someone had to be chairman of the meetings. The chairmanship apparently became a permanent position, and the word bishop was reserved for the one who occupied the position. He was sometimes called the president of the church and gradually assumed the responsibilities that had originally rested upon all of the elders. This position, by the year 150 AD, had developed into a monarchical bishop arrangement. And it should be remembered that the control of this bishop that like Maddox is talking about at this early age was confined just to that congregation. We'll start seeing here in a few moments how that started to spread out a little bit. But at this early time, you started having it just confined to a local congregation. And as, uh, as this would start developing and going out, it would become a more rigid position and congregations would lose a lot of their individuality and identity because they would be under control of someone else. As the presiding elder or bishop of congregations developed into a greater power, problems began to arise which seemed to need cooperation of bishops from various congregations. As the bishop from each church would meet with other bishops, similar developments began to take place. And it was not long before there existed in each congregation three separate classes of officers, namely the bishops, presbyters, and deacons. And the first three centuries witnessed a, this very gradual growth of the hierarchical episcopacy organization. So 
Jerome stated as historical fact that this took place very, very, very gradually, as little by little, is what he says. By little and little. And it's confirmed, he said, these things have been said in order to show that the men of old, the same men who were the elders, were also the bishops. But gradually, as the seed beds of dissensions were eradicated, all solicitude was conferred to one on one man. <clears throat> so in the course of time, you start having certain bishops that came to be looked upon with greater respect than others. And we kind of see this outline here, this kind of a structure out of Calvin's book. But country churches had been established by the city churches, were then expected to respect the judgments of the bishop of the mother churches. But some of these royal churches established independently kept their own independence for some time. So it started being that if the church in Hot Springs planted a congregation in Mount Ida, then see that our, our, our bishop's going to oversee that congregation too. And that's what was starting to happen here, that you're starting to have, as they were spreading, one bishop would oversee multiple congregations. By the fourth century, the country bishops were subordinated to the city bishops. They sort of became known as metropolitan bishops. And the hierarchy began to grow with a phenomenal speed. The metropolitan bishops then began to recognize as patriarchs, and one of the patriarchs eventually was recognized as the pope. So we kind of see the structure here, if you can see the, the image on there, um, this comparison of the state organization of Rome versus the uh, the church, but it kind of gives the outline of how how you know the lay people, the bottom, then the bishop, then the metropolitan, then the patriarch, then the council, then the pope. That's a very very vague way, but that, that illustrates what the concept is that there is a a hierarchy that is outside of the word of God. So the first three centuries saw the growth from a simple eldership with a plurality of elders in each congregation to an arrangement with one bishop in each congregation and metropolitan bishops over larger areas controlled by larger cities. So the growth of Rome. So the growth of Rome and the importance of Rome, you know, Rome was already, you know, in the Roman Empire, so it's already the center of the world. But religiously speaking, as far as Christianity goes, the growth of Rome and the importance it played is linked inseparably with the growth of the monarchical episcopacy. Um, they, you can't separate the two. And the idea of, the, of a Catholic church. Now, when you hear Catholic church, we automatically think of a denomination. Uh, that's not always the case. That word means it's a universal church. It's the church that Christ established, a universal church. Uh, we, call, we call it the biblical name uh, from Romans 16, Churches of Christ, but there's a lot of names to be used. So um, when I say that term, Catholic Church, I'm not always talking about the denomination, so I'll try to distinguish from talking about the denomination and refer to it as Roman Catholic Church. So history leads us ignorant to the exact method of the gospel's arrival in Rome. There are three ways that have been suggested. The first and the one that everyone takes for most people take for granted that is true is that the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there's their, their, their contention that Peter and Paul established the church in Rome and that Peter was the Pope there for 25 years or so. The only shred of evidence that they have for this was a statement by Irenaeus written 150 years after the gospel arrived at Rome. He was the first to give a list of bishops of the Church of Rome. Um, however, what is of interest in this is that he doesn't even mention Peter as the first Roman bishop. Um, no writer as early as Irenaeus attempts to claim Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and this began about the third century, middle mid third century, that this claim started. It's possible that Irenaeus was seeking the elevation of Rome in the West rather than over all Christendom. That's just a theory. Um, but in addition, there's even some doubt by some whether Peter was ever at Rome. Uh, he's neither mentioned as an elder or bishop in Rome, nor is there any definitive evidence he ever stepped foot in the city of Rome. Scripture is silent in this regard. It never mentions Peter being in Rome. 
Um, what everybody wants to run to is First Peter chapter 5, where Peter states he wrote that epistle from the city of Babylon. Many take this reference to Babylon being Rome in accordance with Revelation 17 and 18, including historians such as Eusebius. It appears, however, when Eusebius offers the, refers repeatedly to Peter's stay in Rome, he relies upon uh, the unhistorical acts of Peter as his thief, chief resource, and he quotes from Justin and Irenaeus in this regard, where but they also rely on the same uh, source. However, and, and according to Josephus in Book 15, Chapter 2, 2, Verse 2 of his Antiquities of Jews, during the time of Peter, Babylon was still a city and a territory where many Jews dwelled. Um, a note from this book talks about that it was built on the Tigris River at, um, long after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, Babylonian Empire, was destroyed. Um, joining the city of Baghdad, which I believe is an older, older spelling of the Baghdad uh, in Iraq. Um, but it's been called by the name of Babylon, publishing a book, talking about the book by Shilato. Noss also makes a reference to Babylonia being east of Jerusalem, which that might not be the direction for. You have to go a long way east before you came to Rome from Jerusalem. You have to go almost a whole circuit of the world around. So Rome is, east, is west of Jerusalem, not east of it. And Noss makes this reference that it was east of it. While this was what he's talking about was after the death of Peter, most likely, but it corroborates Babylon was not always a reference of Rome. And other historians share this view. He, had words with, he believes Peter was actually executed in Rome, but he rejects the idea that Babylon in 1 Peter 5 is a reference to Rome. Um, Paul is silent also in respect to Peter being in Rome. This is probably the, the greater source of true evidence in this aspect. Paul wrote several letters. In fact, you know, a lot of our New Testament was written by Paul. In his letter, in his letter to the church was at Rome, and in the epistles which were, in Rome, which were written from Rome, he mentions several Christians by name in each letter, yet he never mentions Peter. Um, in his epistle to the church at Rome, this was direct, written directly to the saints there, there are 28 named individuals. Uh, 26 of them are named by name. Two of them are so-and-so's mother and so-and-so's sister. But they are specific people, just not in general, that they're named by name directly. He also names some other people, such as Timothy, Luke, Jason, so Sotha Pater, um, as well as four miscellaneous individuals. You now, Tertius, who wrote the epistle, Gaius, the host. And he, he mentions a lot of people by name. Never mentions Peter. The tradition that makes Peter bishop of Rome, the church in Rome, places him there for many years prior to Paul writing this letter. In fact, there are some estimates that place him as being in Rome about 25 to 34 years. It's odd that if Peter was indeed the bishop of the church of Rome, that Paul would name all these other Christians but never name Peter. We know that Paul names Peter in other, other writings, you know, just name talks about it, about, about him, um, especially about his interaction with him in Galatians. But whenever he's talking about people, here, he never mentions Peter. In the prison epistles, um, there's another example. Paul's first imprisonment in Rome was about two to three years. And during this time, he wrote the letters to the Ephesians, the Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul was under house arrest during this time. He could have visitors come and go, which he talks about in these, yet he never makes mention of Peter coming to visit him. When Paul was in prison the second time in Rome, he wrote at least the second letter to Timothy. Um, there might have been other, there's probably others written, but we know the second letter to Timothy is written there this time. Tradition claims that Peter was in Rome at this time, and as bishop of the church there, but Paul never mentions him. Paul never mentions Peter in association with the church of Rome because Peter is not among them. Scripture makes, never makes any allusion to Peter being in Rome, much less being the bishop of the church of Rome. In fact, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, Paul specifically states that my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. If Peter was the bishop at Rome, as tradition claims, then 
Peter forsook Paul. I don't believe that for a second. I believe after the cock crowed the third time and Jesus looked at him and he ran off bitterly, he never forsook another brother in Christ the rest of his life. That's my opinion, but based off the boldness of Peter and the way that we see him in Acts, I cannot for a second believe that Peter would have forsaken Paul during this time. There's never been anything more than legend or tradition that places Peter in Rome that makes Peter planting the church in Rome or being a bishop of the church at Rome. But there's still this very ancient and apparently well-authenticated tradition that Peter suffered martyrdom at Rome. Whether that's true, again, it's all tradition. It's all legend. That Peter was in Rome for at least a short time might be accepted as fact on the basis of a vast amount of legendary material, but inconsiderable historical fact. It's all legendary and it's, it has no historical support. There are even those who believe that Peter was, was martyred in Rome, but do not believe he actually planted the church there. So that's very interesting. There's a lot of disagreement on there for, because there's not any concrete fact on this. It's all legend and tradition. The second thing we can look at that how, how Rome became the center of the Christianity was Rome was the center of the world. It was literally every major doctrine eventually made its way to Rome. You know, the old saying of all roads lead to Rome was literally crude in the days, the earliest days of Christianity. So it's thought by some scholars that the early Christian minister, missionaries took the gospel to Rome. The third and probably the most likely um, way is uh, from Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 10, when all those nations were named, strangers from Rome are specifically mentioned. So when Peter's mentioning all these people that were from all these different countries there in, in Jerusalem for on the day of Pentecost, and he preached the sermon, and there were 3,000 added into the Lord that day, it's very likely that some of these strangers from Rome might have been among that group. And when they go back to Rome, they're taking the word of God with them. In my opinion, based off scripture, that's probably how the word of God got to Rome, was from, from, from Acts chapter 2. How Rome came to be looked upon as a center of Christianity, though, is a matter of conjecture. We know from the letters of Ignatius, Clement of Rome, and others that Rome was not recognized as this in the, at the beginning of the second century. It has been suggested, however, that by the middle of the second century, that Irenaeus had elevated Rome as the center of Western Christendom. Soon the tradition of Peter and Paul, that they founded the church in Rome, and that Peter's first bishop, these started just becoming generally accepted. You know, the yeah, so-and-so is teaching this, so it must be true type of mentality. But this view is both without scriptural foundation or any solid historical proof. So as heresies became more and more prominent, a distinction needed to be made between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. The orthodox church became to be regarded as the Catholic church, no reference again to the Roman denomination. Again, the word Catholic literally means universal. The early writers viewed the church as universal, and so, which indeed would be the, the idea between, by Jesus' intentions of going into all the world. This is the church, there's only one. There were a number of early attempts to usurp authority and by power seeking individuals. We've already talked about biographies in 3 John. Um, the attempt to control power over the Christian world has been just one of the unique facets of church history. It's something that keeps people popping up. So during the first three centuries, the most important of these would probably have been Victor of Rome. So Victor's attempt to usurp authority brought about two significant factors that contributed to the growth of the monarchical episcopacy. The first was the increase in the importance of Rome to Christian history, and the second was the centralization of power into the hands of one man. Victor failed in this, but, but he made history by a strong effort. And so the church was not long in, after the beginning to start celebrating the resurrection day of Jesus 
once a year rather than recognizing each Lord's Day with a celebration of resurrection. So based off of that, passage like Acts 27, where we see the first century church gathered together on the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper, we know they gathered together on the first day of the week by other passages such as uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Um, and as we, as the men of this congregation get up and often point out, if not every Sunday, almost every single Sunday, they get up there that, you know, we do this every first day of the week. It's a, mem it's a commemoration of the death, burial, um, and resurrection, the sacrifice that was paid for our, for our salvation. We celebrate this through the memorial feast that Christ instituted on the first day of every week. But it wasn't long, though, that we start seeing this idea of changing that even and making it once a year. There's reason to suppose that Easter had been honored from early Christian history, and the first definite record of its celebration is in connection with a visit of Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, to an, an Anicetus, the Bishop of Rome, about 154 or 155 A.D. So the Western Church observed Easter as the resurrection celebration, um, as it came to be called, on the Sunday nearest the day traditionally held as the day of Jesus' resurrection. While the Eastern Church observed Easter on the exact day of the tradition, resurrection day, um, regardless of the day of the week it was on. So there's this idea of, in our modern Easter, it's always on a Sunday, no matter what the date, it's always on a Sunday. Whereas then you had the, the Eastern Church, we're going to celebrate the 4th of July on the 4th of July every year, regardless of the day of the week. So there was that, there was that dispute among the Eastern and Western churches of when they wanted to celebrate Easter, whether on the Sunday or whether it was the exact calendar date. In 190 AD, Victor demanded that the Eastern Church observe Easter as the Western Church did. Uh, this demand was ignored. He then threatened to excommunicate the Eastern Church if they did not heed his demands. Um, while he did fail, it was certainly a step towards a centralization of powers into, into a pope. And we'll see this more, more blatantly done in later dates in history where the pope has gained such power that he actually controls kings and nations. He dissolves marriages between like, man and wife because he wants him to marry another woman and be part of whatever kingdom. So we start seeing that starting to develop at this early stage. So we've seen, therefore, that the first 300 years of the church history, we see, start seeing a rapid growth towards a centralized church government. Um, this movement contributed ever since to the vision of people who hold Jesus to be the Christ. Questions or comments on this morning's lesson? All right. Very good. All right. Thank you all very much.